Hello again. Muscombe History Group channel broadcasting once more, and this time with part three of our English Civil War battles. We've looked at Edge Hill and at Marsden Moor, and this one is the Battle of Naseby, 1645. Sir Henry Vane's self-denying ordinance had brought a more professional approach to the Parliament's military leadership. Several of the ineffective leaders, such as Manchester and Essex, decided the ordinance was intended to slight them. And Cromwell's position remained somewhat ambiguous, as he and Brereton were still members of Parliament but were exempt from the conditions of the ordinance. Cromwell retired on one day from being leader of the cavalry and was reinstated on the following day. But it was time for Parliament to consolidate the Puritan cause and to take the fight against the Royalists more seriously. Parliament already controlled a great slice of the country and was threatening to push further west during the campaign season of 1645. A campaign season that would be fought by the new model army, which was proposed by Sir William Waller after the Battle of Cropredi Bridge. The new model army was to be led by one of Parliament's leaders at Marsden Moor, Sir Thomas Fairfax. The new model army was to be 22,000 soldiers strong. They were to be volunteers from previous Southern Association and Eastern Association armies and some conscripted men from parliamentary territories. It was to be balanced in all arms and capable of sustaining a campaign without support. The volunteers tended to be men who were totally committed to the Puritan cause and savagely opposed to any form of popery. There were to be 6,600 cavalry, divided into 11 units of 600 men each. They were to be paid two shillings per day, but had to supply their own horse and armour, comprising of a breast and back plate, a lobster pot helmet, a buff leather coat, gauntlets and weapons. 14,400 infantrymen were to be divided into 12 regiments of 1,200 men each, with pikemen and musketeers brigaded separately. These soldiers were paid 8 pence per day. Originally, a 1,000 dragoons were attached to some infantry regiments, but they were soon brigaded together as an harassment and scouting force under the separate command of Colonel John Oakey. The army also had an artillery train, led by Thomas Hammond, Lieutenant General of Ordnance. The baggage wagons and ammunition wagons were protected by two companies of firelock musketmen, called fusiliers. Fusilier is a French word for a type of flintlock musket. Flintlocks were in short supply and were notoriously unreliable, but matchlock muskets with a burning match cord were thought to be dangerously unsafe around several tons of gunpowder. The soldiers were also issued with gunpowder. In the new model army, they were issued with one pound of fine powder for priming, two pounds of coarse powder for charges, and three pounds of lead shot, 
or three pounds of lead for shot casting. They carried measured charges in a bandolier of leather bottles, usually known as the Twelve Apostles, and priming powder in a powder flask. The musket was also reinforced with brass edges and had weight to be used as a club or a battle axe in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The pikemen were usually armed with a 16-foot long pike and a shilling sword. Yes, a sword that cost a shilling. They were protected by Morian-style helmets, often with cheek pieces to protect the face, a breast and back plate to protect the upper body, and two tassets hanging from the waist and protecting the upper thighs. The new model army had one pikeman to every two musketeers, and the pike was frequently shortened to around 12 feet to make it easier to carry on the march. The new model army was the first British army to be entirely uniformed in scarlet coats. Uh, well, to be more precise, in coats of Venetian red, which was the cheapest dye available at the time. The new model army was treated as a joke by the king and Lord Digby and even some parliamentarians. It was referred to as the new noddle. But the threat was considered real and it divided the royalist leadership. Prince Rupert, appointed as senior commander of the royalist army, took the new model army seriously, having been beaten by Fairfax and Cromwell at Marsden Moor. He wanted to join his brother Morris, who was at Chester, and reclaim the North. Lord Digby considered the new model to be a threat to Royalist Oxford. A third group preferred to consolidate the southwest of the country. Fairfax was about to march with the new model to relieve the siege of Taunton. But Charles sent Rupert north to link up with Morris coming down from Chester. Parliament's Committee of Two Kingdoms was sufficiently worried by this to order Fairfax to lay siege to Oxford. To relieve the siege on Oxford, Rupert came across from Market Drayton through Ashby de la Zouche and stormed and carried the parliamentary city of Leicester. Fairfax lifted the siege at Oxford and marched north to find Rupert. And almost immediately, the king, with his army, marched north to join Rupert. Fairfax joined up with Cromwell at Newport Pagnell and they moved on towards Leicester. The king and Prince Rupert, accompanied by Prince Maurice, joined forces at Market Harborough. The King wished the combined force to march to Scotland and join the Duke of Montrose. But Rupert and Marmaduke Langdale preferred to engage the new model army that was known to be on its way. To have it harassing their rear on a march to Scotland would have been too dangerous. On the 12th of June, both sides became aware of the other, when parliamentary scouts made contact with royalist outposts at Deventry. The new model army set for battle on the ridge that overlooked the road from Market Harbour to Deventry, 
but it was decided that this position was too strong and that the Royalists would not attack the New Model Army. So the New Model Army retired towards Naseby. Typically, the infantry on both sides would form up in what was generally called a tercio, and a series of tercios would form a battle line. This was formed as a block of pikes in the centre and a block of musketeers of equal numbers formed on either flank. The tercio was usually formed six ranks deep and the musketeers would fire by introduction or retroduction. Introduction means the rear rank marches to the front of the column and gives fire. They then stand and reload as the other ranks advance in turn and give fire at the front of the column to the enemy. Bang. Advance. Bang. Advance. Bang. Advance. Bang. Advance. Bang. Advance. Bang. And now the original line of musket men are reloaded and ready to advance and fire again. You will notice that this formation gradually advances towards the enemy. Retroduction means the front rank gives fire, then marches to the rear to reload whilst other ranks give fire as they reach the front, and immediately march to the rear until their rank reaches the front again. So this time it goes bang, retire, bang. Retire, bang, retire, bang, retire, bang, retire, bang, retire, and again. The row of soldiers that first fired are reloaded and ready to fire again. But this time you will notice that the formation gradually retreats away from the enemy. It is generally thought that the Royalist infantry was equally divided between pikemen and musketeers because of a shortage of muskets. This would mean that a Royalist tercio would have a slower rate of fire but would be enthusiastic to get to grips in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The disposition of the two armies prior to Naseby is clearly mapped by a contemporary engraving. The battle flowed from this deployment, starting on the left of the engraving, through the centre and across to the right. The king took command of the royalist forces, leaving both Rupert and Morris free to act as dashing cavalrymen and Parliament was commanded by Thomas Fairfax. The battlefield itself can be found about two miles north of the village of Naseby, which is drawn on the engraving at the bottom. Just above Naseby is Red Hill, a long hill that commands the battlefield. On the other side of a shallow valley is Dust Hill, and in between is an area known as Broad Moor. The battlefield itself is hemmed in by the Solby Hedges, which were almost impenetrable in places. The parliamentary baggage formed up just outside Naseby Village, and the parliamentary army itself lined up on Red Hill with Skippen's infantry in the centre and 
Ayrton's horse and Cromwell's horse on either flank, with Fairfax's reserves bringing up the rear on the reverse slope of Red Hill. The Royalist army had Astley's infantry in the centre and Rupert's horse and Langdale's horse on their respective flanks, with the King holding a reserve on the crown of Dust Hill. If we simplify the battlefield a little, we can see Red Hill to the south, on which the parliamentary army is formed, with Skippen's infantry in the centre, Ayrton's horse on the left wing, Cromwell's Ironsides on the right wing, and Thomas Fairfax in reserve on the reverse slope of Red Hill. Across the other side, on Dust Hill, we can see the Royalist army. Astley's Tercios forming the Central Infantry Group, with Rupert and Morris on the right wing, and Langdale's Northern Horse on the left wing, and the King with his reserves on the crown of Dust Hill. The wagon and baggage are guarded by firelocks and are located behind Ayrton's Horse and Cromwell is soon reinforced by Rossiter's Newark horse that has ridden down from Melton Mowbray. The artillery train is still trying to get onto the field, though some small pieces of artillery have been set out. And then Cromwell suggests that Oakey's dragoons gallop across the rear of the army and take post behind the Solby hedges where they can give fire to any force attacking down the parliamentary left wing. As a first move, Rupert and Morris advanced to within charging distance of Ayrton's horse. But as they stopped to reform their lines and get ready to advance, they themselves are engaged by Oki's dragoons from behind the Solby hedges, and Oki's fire is so intense that they begin to cause casualties amongst Rupert's force. So Rupert and Morris are left with no alternative but to charge down Ayrton's horse. and it's not long before Ayrton's horse is routed and flees from the battlefield. Rupert and Morris now have the entire left wing of the parliamentary army at their mercy. They could turn and roll up Skippen's infantry, but instead they decide to follow the tactics of the Thirty Years' War cavalrymen and charge on to take the baggage wagons and steal whatever plunder can be obtained. And effectively, they leave the battle. What happens next is that Astley's Tercios advance across Broadmoor to engage Skippen's infantry at Push of Pike in hand to hand fighting. As the Tercios move across, they can be heard by Ayrton's men on Red Hill, but they can't be seen because these men are on the reverse slope, so they need to be reinforced and have their morale boosted. At the same time, Langdale's northern horse advances to charging distance of Cromwell and Rossiter. But Cromwell immediately countercharges.
and Langdale's men break and are routed from the field. To be pursued by Rossiter's cavalry, but not by Cromwell. Cromwell now turns his iron sides to threaten the entire left wing of Astley's infantry. And at the same time, Oki's dragoons have remounted on their ponies and have come out from behind Solby Hedge to threaten a light cavalry charge on Astley's right wing. And even better, some of Ireton's cavalry have reformed and return to the battlefield in time to support Oki's dragoons in their attack on Astley's right wing. It's not long before the Royalist infantry is almost completely enveloped by parliamentary troops, in much the same way that the Roman army was enveloped by Hannibal's forces at the Battle of Cannae. The king suggests advancing with the royalist reserves, but Cromwell's force turns to meet this threat, and the king's advisers lead him away from the battlefield to safety. In the meantime, as these infantry tercios have dissolved into a rabble, and Astley's men are fleeing the battlefield. Taking with them the Royalist Reserve, and pursued by Parliamentary Cavalry. The infantry then form up and follow in hot pursuit. And when Prince Rupert and Morris return to the battlefield, they find that the battle is over and they have missed it once again. All that is left for them to do is to quietly steal away. Fairfax's forces pursued Royalist survivors fleeing north towards Leicester. Many were killed when they mistakenly followed what they thought was the main road to Leicester into the churchyard in the village of Marston Trussell, from which they were unable to escape before the parliamentarian pursuers slaughtered them. Parliamentary troops also killed and disfigured at least a hundred women camp followers. The women were probably the Welsh wives of some of the troops fighting on the Royalist side, but the parliamentarians thought they were speaking Irish and slaughtered them as papists. Fairfax recovered Leicester on the 18th of June. He turned southwest to relieve Taunton and capture the Royalist West Country. The Royalist force surrendered at Truro in Cornwall. The Royalist commanders, Hopton, Hyde, Capel, and Charles, Prince of Wales, all fled to Jersey. After Naseby, the king lacked the resources to create an army of quality again. He had lost all of his guns, most of his veteran infantry, and most of his field officers. It simply remained 
for the parliamentary armies to take out the remaining pockets of royalist resistance. In some ways, a more serious loss was the capture of the king's baggage. In it was found what became known as the king's cabinet, which had actual evidence of the king's cessation treaty with the Irish Catholics and European Catholic monarchs. Publishing these documents gained Parliament the authority to fight the war to the finish and lost King Charles much of the neutral support that he may have had. Charles fought several skirmishes in retreat, finishing with a battle at Chester where Marmaduke Langdale's horse was more or less annihilated. Charles then went across to Southwell in Nottinghamshire in the hope that he could surrender to the Scots besieging Newark and be taken to his Scottish kingdom. But the Scots sold him to the English and the First English Civil War was over. A second war was fought while Charles was in custody on the Isle of Wight, and eventually his machinations and mendacity led to his trial and execution. At his trial, he conducted his defence with great skill and dignity. The basis of the trial had no real credence whatever and should not have stood. But Cromwell and the leaders of the army wanted Charles dead, as he could ferment dissension within the parliamentary ranks. After the king's death, the Commonwealth was declared, but after Cromwell's death, the young king in exile was called back, and Charles II ascended the throne with the restitution of the monarchy. So that completes our story of the three battles that shaped the English Civil War. We hope you found them interesting and hopefully we'll see you all again soon when we renew our meetings. Meantime, stay safe, stay healthy and bye for now.